uh, seminar. Thanks for coming along. And uh, this uh, seminar is by uh, Dr. Uh, John Wynne here, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, I'd like to start by um, saying that uh, language documentation, which is an area dear to several of our hearts here at least, that for language documentation, it, its goals for language endangerment can't be addressed by drawing on linguistics or formal linguistics alone. It, rather, it has benefited from understandings and interactions with uh, other uh, allied areas like applied linguistics, sociolinguistics, uh, sign linguistics, but not only that, but also from the knowledge and techniques of uh, other disciplines such as anthropology, uh, ethnography, history, biology, media studies, and the performing and the creative arts. So it's in that context that um, I've got great pleasure in introducing John Wynne, who I've known, or some of us have known, since about 2005. I've also had the honour of collaborating on a couple of his projects. Now, as for John, he's a sound artist. He has a PhD from Goldsmiths College. He's currently a reader in sound arts at the University of the Arts here in London. He's a core member of the Creative Research into Sound Arts Practice Group. He has, if you look at his web pages, you'll see that he's won many awards and prizes for his uh, exhibitions and his work. His work's often based on significant research and field work, and uh, his, um, his um, outputs have been shown in museums, galleries, uh, public spaces, uh, radio, a range from massive installations to flying radios. He's been included internationally in the USA, uh, in Canada, Thailand, many places here in the UK, and uh, several places in Europe. His long-term research projects have involved working with people, including um, heart lung transplant patients here in the UK, and some endangered languages communities in um, Canada and Africa. To give you a flavour of his work, these are some of the titles of his exhibitions. Um, 230 Unwanted Speakers in Walnut Grain Vinyl Veneer Particle Board Construction, Interactive Plastic Carrier Bags, Installation for 300 Speakers, Pianola and Vacuum Cleaner, Transplant, uh, Hearing Loss, which was an autobiographical or biographical piece uh, relating to John's own father, Hearing Voices, which is a well-travelled exhibition but was, uh, I think, first or... No, not first, but maybe second run... Third showing was third here. Yeah. shown here at the Brunei, Brunei Gallery, with which uh, the uh, Endangered Languages Project had a lot of uh, interaction. We actually ran a parallel exhibition. That uh, work on John's side featured uh, Khoi and San languages from Namibia and Botswana. And um, most recently, um, an exhibit called Anspaya, um, which is an audio photographic and linguistic documentation of speakers of the endangered language Gitsanimach, who live in a small reserve in northern British Columbia in Canada. That was a project that John undertook together with um, a visual artist and linguist. So I'm sure we'll hear about, quite literally, uh, some of these uh, projects in John's presentation. So I hand over to you, John. Thank you, David. Um, just realised I hadn't plugged my laptop in. I don't want to lose power in the middle. So. In 1963, I was sent to a residential school in Edmonton.
And the, what they fed us mostly there was spam. And uh, one day, Uh, there was a riot at the residential school. Uh, I was outside on the ice rink and I heard some commotion. And uh, some of the older boys had broken into the pantry where they kept the spam and they threw boxes and boxes and boxes of uh, spam out onto the the driveway and uh, the police were called and they were driving over these cans of spam and later the Department of Indian Affairs was called and the food did improve a little after that. And, and that was at uh, Indian Residential School. Um, I, I wanted to start that way to kind of, um, as a way of kind of <laughs> highlighting the inadequacy of, of translation in, in a sense, uh, and also to kind of, um, uh, in a way, putting myself through the, the um, I, I was translating uh, the words of uh, uh, one of the project participants, Gary, here. Um, and I was, I was trying to sort of put myself through the, the, uh, the, the process of, of remembering oral history through, I mean, my, my knowledge of Gitsanamak, which he was speaking, and uh, I will play a bit later, uh, of if him actually uh, speaking it. Um, is very limited. Uh, there were when when I first recorded Gary uh, Gary Williams um, with the uh, linguist Tyler Peterson, that, uh, who David mentioned earlier. Uh, he was when he spoke in Gisanamak, He went through a long story, um, and pretty much th the only words I understood at that point were uh, spam and riot, <laughs> which of course <laughs> kind of. Uh, got me interested and as soon as he stopped I, I said what was that about a, a, a spam riot <laughs> and uh, and then he told the story in English um, which was was generally what we asked people to do uh, sometimes they spoke in English first and and the translation so to speak was was uh, in their other language um, uh, in in most cases however like with Gary the his the, the story was first in in Gisanamak and and then in um, in English um, oh this is gone okay So uh, it was interesting, actually, just uh, a, a Facebook friend of mine the other day, uh, a native woman in Canada, uh, posted something which, which I hadn't realized about residential schools. I don't know. I assume most people probably, perhaps everyone knows what a residential school is. Anyone who, who doesn't really know what it is? Um, well, residential schools in, in Canada, and they, I assume they existed in Australia as well, uh, were, were um, schools that native kids were forced to go to, um, usually, and all, quite often anyway, uh, hundreds of miles from where their community was. And uh, in the case of the Gitsan, they grew up in a community uh, sort of at the confluence of a couple of rivers, and salmon is a huge part of the culture and the diet and uh, year-round, the various ways they prepare it and, and um, preserve it. 
And then these kids are sent away to uh, residential school hundreds of miles away and fed spam, which um, for those of you in, in the younger generations who might not have heard the original <laughs> use of the word spam is like canned uh, corned beef. Um, oh, there's beef in it, is there? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> processed meat, I, I, I thought it was beef. Maybe in Canada it was beef, maybe it was other things elsewhere. <laughs> Um, anyway, so the, the, the Gary story was about this uh, spam riot. Um, and I thought it was interesting that uh, of all the, the stories that, that uh, he presumably could have told about his time in residential school, that, that was the one that, that he chose to, uh, to uh, talk about. Um, and one of the things that's, that's uh, interesting to me is the humor that that is kind of mixed in with with tragedy, with a, a lot of uh, a lot of situations like residential schools, but there are still uh, still um, things happening with re residential schools in Canada. There was recently, and it's still going on, a kind of truth and reconciliation uh, process where um, uh, uh, survivors of residential schools are are. Um, kind of bringing out stories and, and there are still investigations going on as well and recently uh, the government ha has been forced to um, uh, reveal, this is sorry going back to where, where I started uh, was that uh, my friend Angela uh, posted something about a, a, an electric chair uh, in one of the residential schools um, and which I hadn't heard about before but it's only recently it's, it has it came out some time ago, I think, but the government has had been uh, suppressing it, uh, and they've only, it, it's, it's sort of just come out that they have to um, uh, release some of this information about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, apparently there are, this was, uh, this is one particular school in Ontario, a uh, Catholic school at Fort Albany, um, and uh, uh, in, apparently, in the, there was an electroshock chair uh, used for punishment in the in the school's basement. Uh, apparently, until the school was closed in 1973. Um, uh, and um, another thing I was uh, kind of looking into for this talk was uh, um, something a little closer to where we are now: uh, the Welsh knot, which um, presumably also some. Perhaps many of you uh, know about um, it's a block of wood that children in Wales were forced to wear um, uh, if they were heard uh, speaking uh, Welsh in in the English schools, uh, and uh, a child who was heard speaking Welsh was forced to wear a, a block like this around their neck, and if they heard another child speaking it, they got to pass it to that child, and at the end of the day or the week, uh, whatever the system was, that child would then be uh, um, uh, punished, um, usually caning or something uh, like that. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it apparently uh, um, has been claimed that this happened as recently as the 1940s uh, in Wales. Um, and uh, in, in sort of looking at uh, 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 looking that up last night, I came across a, an interesting um, image of a performance artist uh, in Wales. Uh, this is uh, Paul Davies, and um, his. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting my text the right side size to read here. Uh, Paul Davies' performance holding above his head a railway sleeper with WN for Welsh not written on it at the National of Steadford in 1977. Uh, his uh, protest in 77 was directed at the Welsh Arts Council, who'd organized a, quote, international performance art event at the Steadford, including Joseph Boyce and many other names, but excluding Welsh artists. Um, uh, uh, so this is a photograph of his uh, protest performance um, at that event, which uh, which I hadn't seen before. So I thought, uh, before getting to the um, uh, endangered languages uh, part of my work, I, I'd uh, go through a few things that kind of led me up uh, to to my interest in um, endangered languages. Um, 
And uh, this is uh, one of my very early pieces. This is um, a sound only piece, but this is, uh, I did have a photograph of this um, guy named James Komodo Kimani. And uh, he's a, a member of the Kikuyu community who was living in the outskirts of Nairobi when I met him. And uh, when I was introduced to him, uh, he made a, uh, I recorded a kind of brief speech he made, um, which was half in, uh, part in Kiswahili, part in English, uh, and part in, in uh, Kikuyu. And he was, he was kind of welcoming me to Kenya and, and saying, uh, I want, to, want you to give greetings to people on your side. Um, and so I kind of made this piece as a way of uh, passing on those greetings and thanking him for his hospitality. And I was quite interested in them as, as kind of phatic statements because they, uh, you didn't really uh, have to understand the words so much to, to understand what he was, that, it, that it was an act of greeting. And uh, for me, they symbolize the, the relationship between visitor and visited. And we're already thus somewhat halfway between language and pure sound. So I, um, I kind of made a, a, a kind of abstract, well, not abstract, but, a, but a, I took it further in the, it took his utterances further in the direction of abstract sound while uh, maintaining some of the ryth rhythmic features uh, of his voice. So this is a piece from 1996. Uh, a part of that piece. Oops. Um, so, um, after that piece, I, I, uh, while I was in Kenya on that first uh, trip, uh, I was also introduced to this man, uh, Ngozi Moshi, um, and he's a, a, a master musician um, from uh, the north of, uh, of Nairobi. And he said, "Oh, you must come and visit me up country." And um, and so I, when I came back to London, I I uh, uh, started planning a trip to go and record uh, him and make a make a piece of work about it. Uh, and, but this time, it started out kind of. My initial idea was to make a kind of sonic portrait of him, as I'd done with uh, with um, James. Uh, but um, this time, I. I I got very interested in uh, in the sounds of the environment where he lived as well, which was uh, near a, a sort of dwindling uh, pocket of rainforest, uh, a rainforest that once stretched all the way across Africa, and now it's just in small uh, pockets. Um, so I, uh, I was also interested, in, uh, also wanted to kind of acknowledge the, the sort of subjectivity of the piece and the effect of, of, uh, of my own kind of memory and my experience on it. Uh, so I, I was using both his voice, uh, his, his instrument, and recordings I made around uh, the area with him. Um, I'll just play you some, some short uh, clips from this piece, Upcountry. Uh, 
Um, oops, where's it gone now? And uh, from another section of it, let's see if I can find. I said, Woman and Woman and Woman. That is was very, very last song which I heard when I was very small person. And uh, the people were doing uh, licking somewhere and uh, they just uh, singing about of some different name of people who, who was their performance, the song. Uh, and uh, just finally a, a, a bit from the end section of that piece. <laughs> So in the end section there, you're hearing a combination of, of unmanipulated sound and his voice manipulated and his uh, shiriri, the one-string fiddle that he plays. Um, but I, it, um, one of the things that, that kind of struck me in retrospect about that piece was uh, was about the uh, was was kind of feeling slightly uncomfortable about the manipulation of his voice um, uh, in a way. So. When I came uh, uh, to the the Hearing Voices project, which was um, uh, based on uh, click languages in the Kalahari, um, I, I still wanted to kind of uh, explore some of the boundaries between documentary and and abstraction as I was doing in that piece. But um, it took me a long time to kind of think about ways of uh, both working with the voice and working with the environmental sounds, um, and I, I made uh, a, a couple of pieces uh, from uh, from the materials that I uh, gathered in Botswana. Uh, one was a radio piece, uh, and the other was a as an installation. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that I did think was effective about that upcountry was was a, a way of kind of getting people to listen to. Uh, uh, kind of the the grain of of someone's voice in a sense, and and the kind of uh, information that carries, um, and also getting people to sort of uh, hear the environment uh, slightly uh, differently, and doing that by kind of uh, becoming abstract and kind of musical with the materials, but then kind of returning to a, a more kind of documentary style. Um, so I uh, I. Um, Explored that uh, uh, a bit further in the radio piece for hearing voices. Um, so let me just um, play uh, some some bits from 
from that. There's a, a long, slow introduction. This is a this is a, a piece, a half hour piece that was commissioned by BBC Radio Three, uh, and there's a, um, a very long, slow introduction. But in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of uh, edit that down and just play you the last uh, 30 seconds or so of of the long introductory sound, and then. Uh, into the body of the piece, then I'll sort of pick and, and choose bits through there. The women and children like to go and collect wild berries and edible and succulent growths when there isn't much water available. They often go out for the whole day. In the wildness, the small children sometimes get thirsty and the group must go back home to get water for them. The men go further to hand, so they go where they know there's water, and they drink from those water points. The women don't go as far together, but where they go, there is no water. Tongue language is spoken in Botswana. There are some very few speakers of Tongue in Namibia and in South Africa. It's got five fundamental tricks: the bilateral, which is the, and then the dental, the interdental, the, and then the alveodental, the, and you've got the palatal and the lateral. A comb is not written, it's the most difficult, has a click inventory, talking of uh, the, the fundamental clicks and their influences, that is the accompaniment, that number over 120. I personally feel inferior to somebody who can produce 80 different click sounds. <laughs> Oh, 
quite clearly this alarm, which is that won't survive beyond the next generation. So uh, that's uh, the first, well, the, the, from the, from the uh, start of the piece. Um, and uh, part of my, my reasoning with, with, uh, with handling the manipulation of languages was to, um, to manipulate the, the, uh, <coughs> the people speak, the academics, for the most part, speaking English, uh, as, well as, the, uh, as well as the Khoisan. Uh, speakers. So at the beginning there, uh, with uh, Jose Itzi's, uh voice, what I did was um, I separated the click consonants and the vowels uh, and um, stretched out the vowels so that when she used a vowel, I would then stretch that out to about a thousand times its its uh, natural length, kind of create this chorus of uh, of, of vowels, um, and there a kind of uh, Kind of inventory of clicks in a way that were edited out from her speech, um, and when I came to the installation, uh, um, I'd, I'd kind of distilled my techniques a bit. When I when I hear this piece now, for me, it it uh, I have reservations about it about about the way that I manipulated the language, um, and I'm not sure I would do it again. But there are <clears throat> I still think there are some interesting things uh, about it. Uh, but uh, you'll hear in the work that I did with uh, Gisanamuk that I didn't manipulate the, the voices. I, I uh, stuck to manipulating uh, the environmental sounds, um, which has a, a, a very different effect. Um, so uh, Jose Itzi was uh, working with uh, Andy um, there. The, uh, the language she speaks, uh, this is a, a quote from... Um, Oh, I forgot to get his name on there. This is, uh, I think, uh, Peter Ladefogad, um, who's uh, talking about the uh, about even the name of this language is particularly difficult um, um, for uh, speakers of European languages uh, to pronounce. Um, the, so uh, this is one of the, I think, five Khoi and San languages that, that uh, I recorded together with Andy. Uh, Jose Itzi is the only one that we recorded uh, not sort of in the Kalahari. She was working, living in um, uh, Gaborón at, at the time, and uh, this was at the University of Botswana before we went uh, up country and, um, and recorded. But um, so uh, uh, her language is one of the most uh, phonetically varied of the of the Khoisan languages, um, and there are uh, currently I think think something like five thousand speakers. Um, I'd have to check that. This might be an old figure I've got, uh, um, and they're mainly in Botswana. Uh, and there are forty eight distinct click variations and some eighty three different ways of starting a word with a click. Um, and uh, the phonetic complexity of this language is, is uh, apparently approaching something like a maximum for human linguistic uh, behavior. Um, so it was, it's, uh, it's quite unusual for uh, someone as young as Jose Itzi to be a, a, a fully competent speaker. Most of the people that we worked with, uh, both in Botswana and in Canada, were middle-aged or older, um, and several of the people that we worked with on both projects have, have died since uh, since we did the recordings. Um, but uh, Andy was working with Jose Itzi to uh, develop a, an orthography of, of uh, her language. Um, so the the uh, the car sounds in that piece I used um, because the the 
Trans Kalahari Highway, uh, which kind of took us up country, uh, a fairly newly um, improved um, highway through Botswana, uh, became a kind of theme sound wise for me in the piece, uh, a kind of a representation of the incursion of technology and also the effect of technology on, on uh, languages and cultures by bringing in uh, people from outside, but also of taking away young people from communities, um, often uh, before they develop a, a kind of fully uh, competent um, use of their, uh, of their local language, they often go away, as Jose Itzi did, but luckily taking her language with her, uh, um, to, the, to the, the bigger cities. And, um, uh, so we also uh, made some recordings um, uh, at the side of the uh, uh, Trans-Kalahari Highway. Um, and uh, in the, this was a squatter camp. These people had been, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the Khoisan have been evicted from uh, their traditional lands uh, in the Kalahari Game Reserve and places where they've found uh, diamonds. And uh, they're, uh, uh, they often live in, in squatter camps like this where there's, uh, uh, they sort of follow the work or uh, in this case they had, the, they had found a, a school for their children so they had to um, stay, uh, stay there. Um, I think, uh, let's see, got a... Um, Yeah, no, I think I'm going to uh, skip that actually. So, uh, one of the things that um, that was uh, uh, is often a challenge in in recording in the field is um, is uh, because making high quality recordings are are uh, is is very important to me, and uh, it's been sort of the basis of of both the collaborations I've done uh, with Andy Chaban in. Botswana and with Tyler Peterson in Canada is my role with them is to uh, provide as high quality recordings as I can as I can provide uh, and um, uh, sometimes as in the case of this uh, squatter camp beside the highway it's 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 not always easy to get um, high quality recordings so in fact in this instance we recorded inside the car um, uh, so I forgot to arrange those slides properly, but uh, so that's uh, me setting up the microphone inside the car, which which uh, worked out fine. We didn't get the the uh, wind noise, and uh, uh, I was using a, a sort of uh, what's normally used in a kind of studio situation, a uh, large diaphragm microphone. Uh, so in in certain circumstances, I try and uh, control the the acoustic environment as much as possible. So when we're recording uh, in other places, I I would kind of try and uh, use mattresses or blankets inside a room to to try and improve the acoustics a little bit. Um, um, the when when people are evicted from the um, game reserve and other sites, they're often uh, sometimes, if they're lucky, given a, a government house that, that might look something like this. This is uh, Tamasobe. It's not actually his house. It's a, a house owned by another, uh, um, or lived in by another one of our participants. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I think I'll play a little bit of um, uh, one of the participants uh, of the project named uh, Roy Sasana, who uh, is uh, one of the founding members of the First People of the Kalahari. And uh, we were lucky that he just happened to pass through and be staying in the same uh, um, missionary place as we were. Uh, so let me play a bit of his... A Jero is a son of a Ghana Koi, a central Shua, we Kanka, 
he speaks Kana quick. Uh, he stands for the rights of the first people of the Kalahari. Lately, these people were removed from the Central Kalahari Game Reserve and put into settlements. And in this settlement, they have undergone oppression, deprivation, and their culture is lost. And uh, they are told that there is development, but the development really is not for them. The development is for other people, and these people are the ones who really oppress them. And therefore, as the people, they remain without uh, their land, they remain without their language, their culture. In the Tswana culture, they are taken as second grade citizens, so they are not like uh, all the people. No, we've got uh, equal rights, the rights to their language. In schools, there's no school that teaches their language, and therefore he feels really that this is very inhuman, this is very degrading, and therefore there is no future if nothing is done to correct this kind of thing. <laughs> I came to Kayute, Yahak Quatuana, Shakana, we win to have a good Chiquan Rayo to Kakum, Ahaha Haji Castor by Yi. Recently, of course, people have tried to connect the fact that Khoisan people are thought to be among the original human beings. And they have been the original human beings with the type of creed that they have. People have tried to connect that with the language. <coughs> that, I think, is still speculative. There's still uh, a lot to be done to really find out the connection between Greeks, beginning of speech, and the fact that the Khoisan people are being thought to be among the original human beings on earth.
It simply is not the case that there is any language anywhere in the world that is primitive. All languages are rich and detailed and complicated. They have thousands of words. They have grammatical systems that enable their speakers to express any idea that they want to express. The language may have only a small number of speakers, but that doesn't mean there's a small language. Basically, it's kind of almost an act of faith for all linguists to say that you can say anything in any language. If you haven't got a way of saying it now, you can make one up. Uh, you can borrow words so that there is no such thing as a language which is deficient on the whole in the ways of saying things. Uh, so that was uh, actually recorded in this room, Peter Ladefogad, when he uh, gave a talk. Um, um, one of the things that I tried to do in that piece, which uh, I often get frustrated when I'm listening to a, a documentary or watching one on television when you hear someone with, who's speaking a, a language that you don't very often hear and it's a, an amazing language and then they very quickly turn it down and have someone giving a voiceover. Uh, so I tried to, as much as possible within the confines of the half hour that I had, uh, try and let uh, people hear the actual voices and have the translation after. Uh, there were a couple of places uh, where it, it just became impossible for me to to have the time uh, to do that because I also wanted to make the piece quite slowly paced so that uh, so that you could hear some detail in environmental sounds as well so that that clanging sound you heard there was a water uh, um, one of those metal water pumps um, with a windmill small windmill at the top um, so uh, Yeah, I think, um, so the, the way that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the installation now. When I kind of, uh, by the time I did the installation, which was after the radio piece, um, I uh, had kind of rejected some of the, some of the methods I was using in, in the radio piece um, and uh, decided to, to make the installation using only, um, only voice sounds, uh, um, but actually someone commented about the installation that it had a, a sense of the desert to it. But um, what I did with the installation was uh, just to use um, the, uh, uh, the the elongated vowels and the um, um, and the click consonants. But rather than putting the click consonants in a kind of strict uh, time grid the way I did in the radio piece, I, I left them in their sort of temporal locations so that the, uh, this kind of um, syncopated rhythm of clicks that went around the room was the, the actual rhythms of the, of the speech. Uh, and then the, the voices themselves would uh, come up occasionally through that. Uh, and what I did with people's images, um, because I was interested in, uh, in kind of uh, questioning or problematizing the ethnographic gaze as well, uh, and, and to kind of acknowledge uh, the, the mediation of technology involved in, in this installation and of all kind of uh, documentation of, of languages in a sense. Um, uh, the photographs were uh, by the same uh, woman who took the photographs for me for the Gitsan project, Denise Rissio, and we discussed during the field work what she was going to photograph, how she was going to photograph it, and she did various things, and then I decided on, on these pictures with the, with the equipment uh, between the camera and the, and the subject, and also I decided to, to print them very uh, sort of faded, um, like this. Um, so, uh, this is uh, this is what the installation uh, looked like here at SOAS. Um, it uh, 
There's an interesting comment, actually. I often find co people's comments in visitors' books uh, as interesting as what uh, what critics say. But actually, I, uh, Stefan is is also a kind of cultural critic. So, um, but he said that it it felt to him like language is uh, slowing down, almost coming to a standstill. Um, and and talked about the the space kind of uh, resonating, which was quite. Uh, um, uh, rewarding for me because that's exactly what I what I wanted to happen and um, uh, people were spending a lot of time uh, in the installation which is another thing that I want uh, to happen um, the the voices the the real voices of the of the participants do uh, emerge from the sound but but in order to hear them all you'd have to spend in this piece I can't remember exactly what it was uh, probably 30 or 40 minutes in the space to to hear it all and and some people were spending uh, all that time, which was was quite good. So it was kind of a a, a piece that that's again meant to like uh, kind of explore the boundaries between speech and sound. Um, and uh, so it showed it showed uh, uh, before it came here. It showed in the National Art Gallery of Namibia, and those are uh, shots of it there. Um, each time I show pieces like this, I I usually adapt them. Depending on the 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 sort of architectural um, configuration of the space I'm given, uh, so um, in Namibia it, it looked like that. In uh, Botswana, where where it showed first, the national uh, uh, Botswana National Museum, uh, it looked like this. It was a kind of uh, octagonal room, I guess. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention is that these the images are actually speakers, so the sound is coming. The sound of each person's voice is coming from the speaker that has their image on it, uh, and so it's a kind of quite immersive piece. You're sort of surrounded by sounds, but you can also, uh, as you see, someone in the in the Namibia installation there, people kind of go up to each one and can hear each voice uh, clearly. And again, I try and avoid people all uh, the, the various subjects speaking all at once. I mean, there's a lot of uh, sound art out there with that that involves a kind of jumble of voices, and I wasn't really interested in that. I wanted people to be able to hear uh, what what people were saying, and uh, so in this piece and in the uh, Git Sound work uh, later on, I provided full kind of uh, uh, translation panel so that you could uh, understand what each person was saying. In this piece, they weren't uh, speaking English; they were only speaking in their um, in their languages. Uh, but uh, as well as kind of creating this uh, uh, space to encourage people to slow down, think about the, the issues of language endangerment and kind of uh, a, creating a kind of contemplative uh, uh, space for that, um, I also was aware that we'd collected a lot of materials and I wanted to make quite a distilled installation in a sense. So I, I started to wonder what I could do with all these materials that would be uh, kind of um, useful both as information for visitors to the exhibition uh, and also kind of uh, almost form a kind of catalog uh, uh, for me and also potentially a, a, a as an archive source for people like the uh, the uh, working group for indigenous minorities in southern Africa to to use for their um, kind of work to raise awareness of of issues. Uh, so I got involved with uh, Peter and David here, um, and uh, we uh, worked on along with uh, Rob Monroe, who was here at the time, who's now in San Francisco. Uh, developed this uh, it, at the time it was a CD-ROM. We've we've recently uh, sort of re uh, redesigned it a little bit, uh, updated some things, tidied some things, and uh, we're uh, releasing it as a as an app now with the uh, language documentation description uh, volume twelve. 12. <laughs> uh, that's uh, the. Uh, image there is uh, Nicodemus Barkard who was uh, our primary translator on the um, on the Botswana project uh, uh, an amazing character who spoke uh, all of the all of the Khoisan languages that we were working with and and they're 
for the most part, mutually unintelligible, but he, he spoke all of them as well as English, German, uh, Setswana, Afrikaans. Um, um, and that's him kind of uh, looking at the disc in, uh, in Botswana when he came down uh, for the opening. But unfortunately, when he, <clears throat> excuse me, when he came down to uh, the capital of Botswana, Gaborun, for the opening, um, the opening was delayed because the, uh, the, <clears throat> the National Museum there is a, a, obviously is a government-run institution. And when uh, they found out that Roy Sassano was one of, the, one of my participants, they said, oh, hang on a minute, the, the, uh, the permanent secretary has to approve this, uh, the disc. Um, and it was only the disc that they were worried about. Uh, and they sort of asked me if I would go ahead with the show without the disc, and I said, no. <laughs> um, so the result of that was that the opening was delayed while the while the permanent secretary looked at the disc. I'm sure when he when he saw the disc, he would have seen that Roy was just saying what he was going around the world saying. Uh, he was involved. Uh, um, I'm not sure if it was at that time or shortly after he. Uh, was working with Survival International, taking the Botswana government to to the High Court there uh, to um, challenge their the legality of of uh, the forced evictions from the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, uh, a fight which they eventually won. Uh, so um, anyway, eventually the the opening went ahead in in at the museum and uh, the this disc, which I had always intended to be a kind of kiosk. Uh, uh, alongside the installation uh, was was allowed to go ahead. Uh, so I'll just briefly show uh, a little bit of the uh, of the uh, app, as we now have to call it. <laughs> um, uh, so this uh, uh, has not all of the uh, material I recorded, uh, but most of it. It's also got a, an essay, uh, an introductory essay by David Toop, uh, who, who writes on sound and sound art. Uh, it, uh, it's got um, some information about the languages themselves, uh, some information about where Botswana is and uh, where we recorded. Uh, it shows the, the roughly the sort of distribution of, of each of the languages. Um, there's uh, Roy Sasana. Uh, and you can jump to uh, to him as a speaker, or you can go to the uh, the speaker um, speakers page here uh, and see the various people that we worked with. So Jose is there, uh, Nicodemus, uh, Roy. We've already heard. Uh, so Nicodemus himself, uh, he was quite. Um, uh, direct about the the problems of of alcohol, both for himself personally and uh, and uh, for the community. There are Nicodemus Baka, there are Kanoas Abai, Ara Skolenta, Rasi Paraka, Rasi Pusi, Ara Haku of Kuhuani, Craft is the Kumis Kaisko Arctic, Erwin Masaro is a Hoji Guru in Kauzi Kauzi. Um, okay, uh, there were also some uh, some uh, choir songs that I recorded, uh, and most of the material on the disc was didn't uh, didn't feature in my installation. So um, there's a, a, a narrow language uh, choir, which is. Um, <laughs> So those are uh, uh, Dutch hymns that were uh, translated into Narrow um, and performed there. So uh, I'll leave that there in the interests of t 
time and because uh, I haven't got to the git sound uh, material yet. Um, so uh, the the uh, Anspayak uh, <coughs> project, um, I I when I started the uh, in the uh, work in Botswana, I didn't really know I didn't know anything about the politics or the history of the Khoisan languages in Southern Africa, and uh, I was only vaguely aware of the notion of language endangerment. But having done that project and learned a great deal about uh, language endangerment, uh, a lot of my PhD thesis was about uh, those sort of issues. Um, I wanted to do a project in Canada, uh, which is uh, where I grew up. I wasn't born there, but um, uh, I wanted to kind of educate myself both further about language endangerment, but also about uh, um, issues um, uh, facing the uh, indigenous communities in Canada. And uh, through my uh, connections here at SOAS, I got in touch with various linguists over there and um, uh, decided uh, both through the, uh, the through the path that I um, I I found uh, and th through preference really to work with uh, the language called Gisanamach. Uh, there are about um, uh, 400 uh, competent speakers of uh, of Gisanamach at the moment. Uh, of course, depending on who you who you ask. One of the features of uh, of Gisanamach that that intrigued me once I started hearing it was the the uh, the presence of voiceless fricatives and the W at the end of Anspayach is is one uh, which interestingly enough is it could hardly be more opposite the kind of clicks that I'd been dealing with uh, in um, uh, in Botswana uh, the uh, Gisanamach is spoken uh, in an area near uh, around the Kispiox Reserve where we did the work uh, in British Columbia on the west west side of Canada. Uh, and uh, as with the other uh, project, I was there uh, partly to kind of uh, provide materials for Tyler, who you see behind the camera there. Um, and uh, I was... Uh, both Tyler and uh, uh, Andy in Botswana had been... Um, as well as their kind of slightly uh, narrower linguistic focus, so Tyler's Tyler's interest is in modality, and apparently there's there's very interesting ways that uh, the cinema uh, deals with uh, modality. Um, they were also interested in the wider context and also just getting people to to say what they wanted to say and and um, kind of uh, the more sociolinguistic uh, side of things, which is uh, what I was interested in. Uh, so uh, again, that that that's uh, an example of us just um, Holly just wanted us to record something uh, of her for her own purposes. She was trying to get some work in the tourist industry, so we kind of. Um, did that for her, even though it wasn't part of uh, what what either of us was was likely to use uh, for our own specific uh, purposes. Um, uh, so, just uh, this is this is an example of of how uh, um, the kind of data or metadata, I suppose it's called, uh, uh, that Tyler is is uh, producing from the materials that that we. Uh, recorded um, very uh, detailed translations and um, I'll play you uh, let's see a little bit of um, I think I'll, I'll skip that that's uh, um, oh, no I will play it <laughs> Please, 
Nej, det var aldrig gedød på den skjorten. Og som lå øjet, og aldrig slag, som aldrig slå øjet. Um, and, uh, let's see. Um, this is, uh, so this, uh, the Ansbayak piece was, is only an installation. I haven't done a radio piece from the material yet. I, I'm still hoping to do uh, something with it. Um, and here uh, is, uh, so anything I'm playing from this installation is kind of a, a reduction from the, it's actually a 12 channel immersive installation uh, mixed down here into, into just two channels. Um, It's very little of that that remains here in the village because our, uh, our descent moved down to the village here about over 100 years ago, over 30 ago. And that just about extincts our own language. The accent is different. I heard my great grandmother speak it. And I'll tell you that's real classic. You talk about Shakespeare compared to uh, present English, that's how it was. Really deep was expression. I love to hear it. I want to use it all the time. I have no problem speaking English. I don't stutter or sputter around or snap my feet trying to speak it. But I much rather use my own. Uh, when we get together, guys like us who don't speak English, like my younger sister, my brother Roy here, but the uh, next generation is entirely different. Students that start speaking this part, each English is speaking, they do understand, but. I don't know why we call Samarga. Um, okay, well, I, I seem to have done spectacularly badly with uh, timing um, today because I've got a, a, a lot of other things I wanted to uh, talk about and say. I'll just uh, go through some of this very quickly. The installation uh, looked like this. It was another one with uh, flat speaker panels. That's what it looked like at the... Um, uh, uh, Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, uh, where it showed for nearly a year, and then it showed again uh, uh, at the end of last year at their satellite gallery in downtown uh, Vancouver. Um, it also showed in San Francisco as part of the American Anthropology, Anthropology um, um, uh, Annual Conference, uh, where it showed in a 
interesting context at the, at a, in a gallery at the back of a bookshop. Um, and I thought that, so when you faced one direction, you saw the bookshop behind. I thought it worked particularly well with that uh, image. Um, the, uh, ah, I, I did want to play a little bit of uh, Gary um, speaking that uh, 1963 in the um, I'm hardy when that would be some riot, so what did I say? Uh, riot. So I just wanted to get a, a bit of that in at least. Um, and uh, of course, one of the one of the things that I, I forgot to mention about the residential schools, which uh, maybe all or most of you know, uh, is that they were, like the Welsh, punished for using their own language um, uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, that's probably a good place to leave it, if we're going to have any time for, for questions. Okay, let's thank John for the talk. replaying several uh, of his uh, of items of his work. There's a few minutes left for questions and as well we will have uh, drinks as is the normal fashion with the Institute so if you want to actually grab John and ask or challenge him he'll be there. Any questions for now? I thought it was interesting um, ling what linguists often do when we try to go out and make recordings. You were talking about doing good quality or whatever. We actually want to throw away all that environmental stuff um, and try and, you know, not have the chickens and the, the noises in the background. Because what we're really interested in the, the fine linguistic side of it. But in fact, you were actually adding yeah. the environment to what you were doing. Should we be paying so much attention to, to try to keep out all the externals, do you think? Or? Well, I th whenever I record voice, I always try and do that as well, um, because I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm probably because I'm a control, <laughs> control freak. Then I've got control over the environmental sounds and how I use them in relation to the voice. So, uh, you know, the, the the sound of the frozen river running behind Bob's voice there wasn't happening when I recorded him. Uh, it was added after. So to try and to try and get a good recording f for the linguist that I'm working with it, with environmental noise um, it is probably not a good idea I think. So no I don't think it's, it's the wrong approach. I mean I've always it's uh, um, from the beginning from my early work from the from that piece from the mid 90s with uh, James Kamola Kimani I was quite interested in in very close mic'd voice and the the kind of the as i mentioned the kind of grain of the voice and i've done a project with uh, heart and lung transplant patients and and what i found with those very close recordings is you you hear the kind of the 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 illness in the body so people with with lung problems um, or or if if it's a heart problem, that you can hear the sort of weakness uh, in their in their physical being, sort of through those recordings that you wouldn't get if I was sort of standing here with a with a microphone kind of thing. So it's it's kind of it's an obtrusive way that I record. So that's that's why those photographs with people with, with the microphones in front of them. That's sort of what people have to put up with when I record them. Uh, but part of the reason I'm interested in um, using still photography with recordings is that I find that people will relax more if it's just a microphone. They, they can quite quickly forget a microphone. People tend not to forget a video camera in their face. So Tyler did want to record video in a lot of cases, but 
I was quite happy that he would just set it up on the side and, and let it run uh, because what we were both primarily interested in was the, the actual the getting the recordings as good as possible. I have a question in the mm -hmm. absence of any others. You, you talked a bit about in your personal journey how you got uncomfortable with manipulating the sounds of the Khoisan speakers mm. and had a bit of a reaction to that later, which I, I think we saw. I think for that would resonate for some of us, I think, who have recorded and worked with languages and says we're very happy to use recordings in language documentation, whatever that is, but perhaps also uncomfortable about commercialization, manipulation, non-authentic um, uh, reproductions or presentations of them. You, you must be closer to a debate about that than, than we are. I wonder if you can tell us more. Yeah, well, I mean, I think partly with me it's a kind of, uh, I suppose it's a matter of of respect, in a sense, or responsibility. Um, and in fact, in the Gitsan work, I did manipulate the voice in one instance, but for me it was a really interesting case where uh, the woman had... Um, we were finished with, with what Tyler wanted to record, and she said, well, I could sing a song for you. So she sang uh, uh, her own translation of an old country song. Uh, into She translated it into Gitsanama. And, uh, for me, that and she also introduced it because I, I wasn't really interested in if you if you want to record um, some of the songs that that are traditional to the community, you have to get very careful permissions. And uh, in some ways, as an outsider in my particular situation, I, I didn't want to go down that road. You know, I could have probably pursued that and got permission for certain songs and things. Um, and we did get permission to record the words of one funeral song. But when she kind of, she introduced this song saying, oh, it doesn't belong to anybody, um, which I found out isn't strictly true. <laughs> um, but um, so she'd taken this country song, she translated it into, into Gitsanama. She sings it quite regularly at ceremonies and things, apparently. Uh, and I felt somehow that that gave me a license to kind of play with it a little mm -hmm. bit. And I did, I, I don't want my work to be too dry, and I, I want a kind of playful element. And 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 there's a point which I didn't get a chance to play, where there's a lot of laughter going on, which there was in a lot of our working situations. And 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 so that those sides of the context of of field work are something that I like to bring into it as well, whether it's environmental sounds or the you know the sort of the more social context of it. So that's a long answer. <laughs> Yeah. This is maybe rather case specific, but I was just curious about the comment that you made about some of uh, the ages speakers when they're fully competent, and I was wondering what you meant about. Being fully well, that's a, I, I, I should have put that in quotation marks. I suppose it's a term that I've picked up from linguists. I think. Um, but I, I, what what is the definition of competence? Is that is that still a, a word that gets used by linguists? It's, it's political. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, what what I meant by it was just a, a sort of fully developed use of the language. So you know, I I kind of defer to to the linguistic debate on whether that's an appropriate word or not to use. But but it's it's the case that we we really had a hard time finding any young speakers uh, in um, uh, in and around Kispiox. We found one. 18-year-old who had apparently grown up with his grandmother and spoke it very well. We got in touch with him. We were never able to kind of uh, get together. He uh, was leaving for university at the time or something. Sorry, is it that they have another first language that they go with? Do you uh, well, yeah, most the, uh, the, the, the situation with Gisanamuk, anyway, is that uh, it's it's skipped a couple of generations so that the older people are speaking it. It's it's now taught in uh, in schools, but for the most part, the peop the children who are learning it in schools are not speaking it at home because their parents don't speak it. Uh, there are certain families like the Wiget family. Uh, oh, this is the this is the Wiget's house here. They're uh, they've really kept up the tradition of the language. Um, 
but I don't think the youngest uh, well it's possible that the youngest uh, ones are starting to learn it. The teenagers uh, in this family weren't speaking, <laughs> but the the uh, some of the uh, very young ones were being taught it at home by uh, by Clara's uh, daughter. This is her daughter Fern, who who sings the song that I was just mentioning. Um, so yeah, but from what I understand is that that speaking it at home is more important, or at least as important, as learning it in school. So if they're learning a few words in school and then going home and speaking English again, uh, it's it's not going to stick. Yeah, um, how did the teachers and the Uh, the only we didn't have any shortage of people wanting to work with us. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Bob, the the guy uh, whose voice you heard um, uh, talking about the the old form of the language that that was like the equivalent of Shakespeare. Um, I met his sister. We we went to uh, bingo one night in the in the on the reserve and I got talking to his sister who was working there and she said oh what are you doing here um, and I told her what we were doing she said oh you have to record my brother Bob he's my encyclopedia um, so she actually um, came to us and invited us over and wanted us to record uh, and she also is a speaker and she is has become really important to, to Tyler's work in the community. Uh, the, the linguist that I worked with had been working there before. He grew up in the area. He has a history of working uh, on that language and he's continuing to work uh, now on it. Uh, and he's, uh, Louise has become really important for, for his work and she spoke at, at uh, a symposium that we organized in Vancouver uh, at the end of last year. Uh, we, um, there were some uh, negative responses. Not many, though. Uh, in fact, Clara's husband, uh, he didn't want to participate, even though he would have been a really valuable uh, participant. He, I think it was, uh, well, the reason that he said was that he didn't want it to be exploited commercially or something. Somehow he had, had some notion that we could make huge amounts of money out of it. I think, or at least that was the reason that he, he gave. Um, there was one negative reaction actually at bingo that night when one woman uh, was talking to me and she said, oh, you know, and it was, it was kind of uh, a response I think that you get to, uh, to uh, from a lot of indigenous communities that feel like they're just being studied all the time and why is money going into studying us when we don't have proper dentists here and that was her kind of argument but for the most part people uh, saw it as a chance to uh, th I mean they understand the, the people who, who do speak it understand that it's disappearing and that, that it's important to them and having someone from the outside come and show interest in it is a positive thing for the most part um, and I think you're always uh, you're sort of at the mercy of the history of, of other people who have come and studied. And luckily within this community, the linguists who've been there uh, over the years have a good reputation. Um, and as I said, Tyler's been working with people there before. So, uh, you know, if someone comes in and does exploit p uh, the, the materials that they gather, it kind of ruins everything for, for the people coming after them in some cases. There was a case in British Columbia of a, a linguist who was working with the community and getting stories and uh, basically there there was a, a, a dispute going on with the railroad company who wanted to drive a, a wider track through their territory or something and so they had to uh, the, the, the native communities in British Columbia are quite unique in North America in that they never signed treaties. So they never actually gave their land away, gave their land away the way uh, many groups did. Uh, so there's land disputes still going on uh, in that part of the world. Um, and 
apparently part of their proof of, of uh, ownership of land or historical ownership of land is if they have place names in certain areas. And this linguist had been working with the community and he kind of, uh, I, I gather probably for, for money, started working for the railroad company in helping them kind of prove where there wasn't ownership of, of the land. Um, and there was another case of, of somebody giving away kind of uh, commercially important information about fishing grounds and stuff and then a, a certain area got commercially exploited um, and was then ruined. <laughs> uh, so things like that have happened in some communities but thankfully not with uh, Gitsan. Well, again, I think I think there are a lot of people there who really appreciate that. I know the working group for Indigenous Minorities was was interested in the work, and they the bunch of them came to the showing in uh, in Namibia. Um, I mean, I think the, the fact that people show interest from outside in languages can help because part of part of the problem with with languages dying out is that people don't see a value to them, and they just think that. Well, if I learn Setswana or English and go to the city, I'm going to be much better off. But it's it's not a choice, you know. It, learning more languages is going to help you, not not hinder you. So um, I think that people showing interest from outside is 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 often seen by some as as uh, as a positive thing. I mean, the the I have kind of some political reservations about using religion as a way of of uh, of helping with languages but there's there's no denying that the the uh, missionaries uh, Hessel and Kobe Visser where we stayed uh, in the Kalahari they're doing amazing work with with the narrow language uh, I mean part of that work is Bible translation but um, they've done a lot of they've also been involved in in dictionary writing dictionaries and um, and developing their orthography of the language Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so if you want to continue conversations with uh, John or amongst yourselves or, or uh, about any of these topics in 15 minutes or so, um, as per usual, some of us will gather at the Institute of Education bar, I think that way. Um, so in the meantime, let's thank John for his uh, stimulating talk.